Okay. Today is May the 28th, 1997. My name is Sharona Bloom. I'm conducting an interview with Sabina Winter, maiden name Hirschsprung. Hirschsprung. Hirschsprung um, in Melbourne, Australia in English. Today is May the 28th, 1997. My name is Sharona Bloom. I'm conducting an interview with Sabina Winter, maiden name Hirschsprung, in Melbourne, Australia, in English. I've got to look at. Good afternoon. Um, can you please tell me your name at birth and spell it for me? Well, Sabina. You want the middle name? Right? Or, well, Hirschsprung. I don't know how to spell it. Okay. And what is your name now? Winter. Sabina Winter. Right. Actually, my name was Scheindorf Reisel Hirschsprung. That's the proper name, what my parents gave me. Can you please tell me your date of birth? The fifth, the second, nineteen twenty-three. Which makes you how old today? Seventy-four. Mm -hmm. Can you please tell me where you were born and spell it for me? I was born in Szanów, Poland. Szanów, you spell S H I N U W. Can you tell me a little bit about Shanov or what you remember? I don't remember mm -hmm. because we shifted to Wadowice. And we lived in Wadowice. Only my grandparents lived in Shanov. Mm -hmm. And I used to go for holidays to my grandparents. Mm -hmm. Every holiday or holidays. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about your grandparents and the town of Shanov, what you remember from your holidays there. Uh, it was a bigger town than Wadowice. It was a big town. There was a lot of Jews there. I had all my family there. And my uncles, my, my mother had, uh, that was my mother's parents. What were their names? Schleume and uh, my grandmother was Kayla Klausner and my mother had three, another two sisters and five brothers and uh, I had a lot of cousins and uh, I spent quite uh, a nice time there, always a nice time. And, and they all perished, there is nobody left from them. And I don't even know where or how they died. Yeah, I remember during the war, when before we went to the ghetto, three of my uncles were hanged in, in uh, Tarnov. Do you remember approximately what year that was? It could be 1941 or between 41 and 42. Mm. I, I don't remember exactly the dates. And do you remember why you were told that they were hung? Or I do, I do, because um, my grandparents were still in Shanov, and those two sons were in Lvov. They ran away to Russia. Lvov was then Russia. And my grandfather said that so far people are working and the Germans don't kill. So they told, they told them to come back. And they, they came back to Tarnov, 
because one of my uncles lived there with his wife and three children. And how far away was Tarnov from Shanov? Would be about 80 kilometers. But, but Shanov belonged to uh, the Dritte Reich, to Germany like, and Tarnov was more or less Poland. It, it was Poland, protectorat, they called it. I don't know how you say it in English, but that's how they called protectorat. And we couldn't go wherever, where, over there to the protectorat, because we belonged to the Dritten Reich. And a day, the same day when they arrived, uh, they took the people from, the, from Tarnov, they took ten people, and my uncle, one of the uncles, was um, a well-known man. What was his name? Moshe. And the other one? Klausner. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my, um, the, 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 the uncle who lived there, it was Moshe Klausner, and the two others was Livy, and Yitzhak. And they come at night and took, they came actually for that one uncle. And they took all three of them and they hanged them. That I found out when I went to Kshanov without my armband. We used to have an armband, white and blue. And I went to Kshanov to my grandparents. And then we find out about it. That was the last time when I saw my grandparents. And approximately when was that? In which year? Or 41 or 42. Okay. I can't remember exactly. I was 16 years old when the war broke out, so yeah. I really remember much. Okay. I'd just like to go back a bit to before yeah. the war and your early life. You told me that you were born in Chanov, but you moved at a very yes. young age to yes. Radovice. we moved to Radovice. My father had a lolly factory. Mm -hmm. We weren't rich, but we were middle class people. And um, I went to a state school, and in the afternoon I went to Beit Yankov. I finished the school. I started even uh, like a high school. And I also had a job, that was an evening school. I also had a job uh, during the day for a few hours, three times a week, in a haberdasher shop. And I supposed to be a basic teacher. But the war broke out, so the plans changed. We were three children at home. I was the oldest, then six years younger was my sister. Oh. I have a photo of my sister too. Okay. What was her name? Chevy. Chevy. Esther Chevy. And uh, I had a, a, another younger brother. I was ne nearly 13 when my, my brother was born. He was... Um, his name was Schmier. We were a very happy family. I remember we were sitting at, uh, in, and, um, at home and a lot of children come around, around the table and we packed lollies and my mother used to sing songs and uh, she gave away the lollies after when we finished to the other children. Do you remember any of the songs she used to yes, sing? Yes, I do remember. I do remember. Sometimes I sing those. I, I sang 
those songs to my grandchildren. Would you like to sing one of those no. songs now? No, <laughs> I can't. <coughs> I lost my voice a long time ago. What, tell me a bit about your parents. What were their names? My father's name was Avram Dovid Hirschsprung. My mother's name was Gusta Klausner. My mother spoke German, Polish and Yiddish. My father was a Hasid. My mother used to wear a shaito. Uh, a wig. And um, we had a real traditional Jewish home. We kept all the holidays. The children were happy. We were playing outside, uh, outside in the, in the gardens, in the streets. And uh, it was a happy, I had a very happy childhood. Can you describe a particular yont of high holiday that you remember when the family were all together that st sticks in your memory? Uh, I remember for Rosh Hashanah, for the, our New Year, uh, always one auntie came to us to be with the children, with us when my parents went to school from Shanu. And um, in the beginning, when we were small, we used to go Pesach, for Pesach to, to my grandparents, to Shanov, and uh, the whole family was there, maybe 20, 25 people were there. They had a big flat. And uh, that was, that stuck in my memory. And um, we all, uh, grandchildren, we sat around and we, were singing and laughing and playing. That was nice. Mm -hmm. And I tried to have a home like that. Can you tell me a bit about the town of Wadavice and the community there? Well, everybody knew everybody in Wadavice. Do you know approximately the population? Two thousand Jewish people were there, and they were. It was a, a really a religious, a religious town. There were all different organizations, uh, Zionist organizations, and um, people. Uh, there was a few very wealthy people, a few. But the majority was middle class. Everybody knew everybody. I had a lot of friends, and uh, we used to go for outings, especially in May. It was the, the spring in Poland. It was beautiful, and uh, that was um, our town had a lot of gardens and uh, forests. Uh, three kilometers from where we live, there was a beautiful forest. And I used to go and um, we picked uh, mushrooms and we picked um, strawberries, little strawberries. They were growing wild. And blackberries, we used to go, especially in May. It was lovely. With the family of no, friends? No, with friends. With friends, not with my parents, with friends we used to go, yeah. And what other things did you like to do? Were you a member of any organizations or sporting clubs? Or? Uh, I was a member of Maccabi. I used to go to gym. And um, uh, we went to, to Baisiankov, as I said, and then Benos. This is uh, like a um, religious organization. I didn't go out with boys, not at that time. And uh, we more or less, we spent, uh, during the week we went to school. And uh, 
from 8 till 1. And then I went to the Jewish school, to Beis Yanko, if they, there was another uh, three hours. And um, we used to play, we used to play uh, dominoes or different games, all sorts of games. And in, in one house where we lived, there were three or four families, and uh, the children all played together. Was it like an apartment building? And yes, a big, a big block, yeah. big building, and we used to play together. Mm -hmm. I still have a friend in Israel. He is older than I am, but we write to each other and we see each other whenever I am there. And. Uh, that's all I have left from, from home. Mm -hmm. That one and only friend and another girlfriend. Mm -hmm. we, we were in concentration camp together. We were in ghetto together and concentration together. We went to school together. She lives in Israel. Can you describe the apartment your family lived in to me? Do you the apartment? It wasn't a big apartment, it was uh, one big room and a very big kitchen. That's all what, what it was. But uh, in that one room, we had um, two beds, a couch, a table and chairs, two cupboards, a mirror, and it, uh, two, I see that room now, two um, near the beds, um, no, how do you call that? Two little cupboards, bed cupboards, yeah. And in the kitchen we had another table, um, a, a big cupboard and then and there was, um, it was, we had water in the kitchen, yes. That was a big thing to have water in the kitchen, <laughs> in those days. <laughs> we don't realize it now, because everything uh, is so handy for us. Mm -hmm. Did um, your family attend synagogue regularly? Oh, yes. As I said, my parents were very religious, mm -hmm. my mother and my father. My father used to go twice a day to the synagogue, in the morning and in the evening. And, he all, and we had a factory, a lolly factory. He was working during the day. My mother helped him. How far and was the factory from your home? Just heart? across the road. It wasn't and far. What was the name of the factory? There was no name. No name. Vrup Tsukerkov. That was, that it means uh, lolly factor. No names. And what do you remember of the synagogue or shtibel that your family attended? It's like all other synagogues. A synagogue is a synagogue. That's um, I remember that I used to go with my mother um, Rishhoidish, that means once a month. And that's how I learned really how to, to pray properly. And uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, I went also, high holidays, I also went with my parents, with my mother. I was sitting with my mother and my father was sitting in the, in the men's shoe. What was the relationship between the Jewish and non-Jewish communities in your town? Oh, I had uh, two or three friends, non-Jewish friends. Not many, but two or three. And um, it's in Poland, um, the children used to go on Saturday to school, but not on Sunday. And um, being a uh, state school, and I was Jewish, religious. I didn't go on Saturday, so on, on Sunday I used to go to my non-Jewish friends 
and wrote them homework, what they did on, on Saturday. So it was a good relationship between us. Okay. And what languages did you speak Polish. at home? At, uh, we spoke Polish and Yiddish. Okay. Uh, so you weren't aware of any anti-Semitism in um, Oh yes, Gadovitsa? I was aware. Okay. I was aware. Okay. Can you explain that further, please? Um, sometimes when I went to school, they called us Jew, or like you would say, bloody Jew. And I remember when you see, when my uh, father, when he made the lollies, he sold it to other shop, to shops and to people who used to go on to markets and they sold it at the markets. There was a lot of poles. And um, around, our, uh, around our town, there were smaller little cities. And... Uh, <coughs> And um, we used to send the, the, the lollies by train. There was no trucks like today. We used to send them by train. And my father used to go once a week to collect the money. So when he go, went to the station, I, I had to go in front. My father was in the middle, and my mother was the last one because we were scared that the Polish hooligans will throw stones at him because he used to wear a beard and uh, he was dressed in black, you know, like the Hasidim today. And uh, so I was aware of anti-Semitism in Poland. Okay. And we did, all were aware about it. Right. And did that ever happen? Did they throw stones at oh, you? Oh, many times, many times. But, uh, you know, that was the last couple of years what I remember. I don't remember that when I was smaller. So this was towards the... Towards the end, about 37, 38. Uh, yeah. yeah. Was there any other anti-Semitic incidents that you can recall? Well, they, sometimes they, they, they broke windows, sometimes. In Jewish houses? In Jewish houses. Or there was a beautiful park and we had to pay to go in into that park in Wadowice. And uh, towards the wall, they didn't let us go in into that park. Not even to the park. There were other parks, but especially that, particularly that one park. No Jews were no allowed. No Jews were allowed to. Right. Okay. So what? Besides, you see, when we came to Australia, we didn't believe our eyes that a country can exist like that. That they exist a country like that with so much freedom and you can be whatever you want to be. Mm -hmm. That's why I keep telling everybody to appreciate what we have here. I keep telling my children, they don't know how lucky they are. Besides the signs that you just mentioned, what were other signs of danger to you and your family that things were going to change? No. no. No, nothing. No. no. So how the did the only thing what we d we couldn't believe because we've heard that that um, a people were sent out uh, uh, from Germany, they come to Zbonshin. That was uh, like near. Uh, it wasn't Germany, but it was Poland near the Polish border. And uh, and. Um, when they come and they told us stories that what goes on in Germany, we didn't believe it. Because, and my mother always said, it's impossible. The German people are too cultured that they can do things like that. 
we will be, if, if it will be war, God forbid, we will be working and we'll leave. That's what we were told. So how did Hitler's rise to power affect you and your family? We didn't believe the beginning, in the beginning we didn't believe. We did not believe that things like that go on. No, no, we were already in the ghetto and we didn't believe the days in Auschwitz. We couldn't believe. We thought that we will work and leave because they told us that as long as we will work, we will leave. Not in good conditions because we didn't have much to eat, but we will stay alive. Especially the children, the young generation. My, my parents were only young. They were, what, 40, 45, 46, something like that. And um, we thought that as long as we are useful, we will be, we'll stay alive. Mm -hmm. Can you please tell me about the period leading up to you and your family going into the ghetto? W what were the events that led Look, to that? You see, we, we, when the war broke out in September, we ran away from Wadowice and we went to, we went to Yaroslav. My father had two brothers there. Right. Where was Yaroslav, Yaroslav in relation Yaroslav was in to Galicia. Right. And we ran away. I remember when we ran away from Wadowice, on the way we had to go out from the from the train, because wherever we went, the Germans were first, before us, and, and uh, the bombs were running, we were lying down on, on, on the ground, and there was a bomb uh, maybe two feet away from, from me. And we came to that um, Yaros to Yaroslav, where my uncle lived, that was my father's um, brothers, and uh, we stayed there, I don't remember how long, a week or two weeks, and then, I have to finish. Can you finish? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then uh, one day they come and they said that to pack, and they will be, they have to go to the Russian border. So instead to go to the Russian border, my father said, let's go back. They going to the Russian border, we have to go back. And so we went back to Wadowice. And um, we went back to our home. This is the end of tape number one. This is tape yeah. number two of an interview with Sabina Winter. At the end of the last tape, you mentioned you were on a train to Yaroslav and there was a bomb yes, next to you. Yes, Can but you nothing happened to anybody. The bomb exploded. The bomb exploded and um, we were all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you were telling... Then we yeah. returned back to Wadowice. Right. When approximately was this? That was still in 1939, a few weeks later, probably a few weeks, because it took a, a, quite a, a few weeks till we g got there to Yaroslav, and a few weeks on the way back. And when we came home, our, uh, we had a cleaning woman, and she was living in, in our flat, and she looked after it and we had everything, nothing was stolen, we had everything, so we were one of the lucky ones, but not with the factory. Whatever was in the factory, they took out, because they looted the, the, the Jewish homes, the Poles 
brought out the Jewish homes and, and um, the shops. And we started, we started working for the Germans. My father cleaned the streets. It was already towards winter. They had to shovel the snow. And um, I was cleaning at the Germans' houses. And for that, they give me bread or butter or sugar or something like that. We get food for it. And uh, we still stayed in our homes. Only who had a bigger home or a bigger flat, they had to take in some people from other little towns. Because they tried to bring, from smaller towns, to bring, to keep the Jews together in one place. Did your family need to take in anybody? Yes, we did, we right. did. And who did you take in? We took in two girls from Germany, and they lived with us. Actually, that wasn't the girls, that was a mother with a daughter, and they lived with us. Do you know what happened to them after yes, the war? Yes, I do, I do. The mother was uh, <coughs> sent away with the auction. That was when they took the people together and uh, it was a selection of people. We call, they, they, they called it an auction. And they sent them to Germany for work, to work there. And that uh, girl who was there, she went later on into the ghetto and she went with me to the concentration camp. She is in Israel now. We see each other quite often and we write to each other. Still in um, Vadovice, still not in ghetto, in our own home, they confiscated the most uh, machines what we had to make lollies from my parents. My father took out whatever he could. And we had it all in, in our flat. Uh, uh, my father tried to, to work a little bit to make, to make some lollies, but it wasn't allowed to. We weren't allowed to do it. But he did it and uh, he got caught. Who caught him? The Germans caught him and he was in jail without a trial for a half a year. When he came out from jail, he weighed 36 kilo. Where, and, um, where in jail was In Vadovice. Oh, there so was a big jail, yes. And you were able to visit him? No, no. not at all. Not, we couldn't visit him, but we had a Paul who was um, working there, and uh, sometimes he smuggled in a little bit of food for my father, because my father kept still kosher. He wouldn't eat what they gave him there, so of course for money. And he was in jail for a half a year, and we didn't, we didn't know when he will come out. There was no trial, nothing. We didn't know when he will come out, what happened to him. We knew that he is alive through that Paul. And then one day he came home, just like that. What was the family's reaction? Oh, you can't imagine. You can't imagine how happy we all were. But we were separated from our grandparents, from the grandparents and from the aunties and uncles. We only had the, uh, the immediate family. My brother, my sister, and my parents. And that's all. And 
didn't, uh, we were still working. My mother used to go and clean and uh, clean houses for the German. We all were working, all of us. And uh, that went like that till 1942. Then there was another auction. A selection. A selection, yes. And they took all the Jews in, in, um, on a place, a big place where the kettle, where the kettle, they put, they sell in kettle. And um, we all had packed rucksacks. We all had, all, all the time, we had a rucksack packed. Uh, they told us in the middle of the night, they come, knocked at the door, they come, aus, rouse, you the rouse, that we should get out. And they took us there, but we knew before, you know, that it'll happen one of those nights. How did you and, know? You know, people were talking, and one to another, and um, I was scared of my fa about my father, so I took my father to um, not a neighbor, but he, there was a, he was a customer of ours, and he he hit my a pole, and he hit my father. In exchange for the attic, in exchange for a watch, for my father's watch. It was a gold watch with a chain. We didn't know for how long he would have to stay hidden, but he hid him. And um, the same night, that was a day before my father went into hiding, and the same night they come and knocked on the door. And we all went, and that was the selection. And I was... I was a pretty girl, and I was selected for one side that was rechts, links, right, on left, uh, and left. And I was selected to the living one. That was the first time when I saw Mengele. Can you please describe Mengele and how Mengele, you knew it, well, who it he, was? Well, he had a patch in his eye, and we knew because the... the the SS men who, who came to the selection, they were talking and calling him by, by the name. We, we heard it. And he had a um, stick in his hand, and, and, and that's how he might. Anyhow, my mother. Be before, sorry to interrupt, before that, did you know anything about Mengele, or no, had you heard the name? No, or, no. nothing at all. No. But we knew that they are sending people away to uh, Arbeitslager, uh, work, uh, well, work camp. Well, to a camp where you can well, working work camp. camp, yeah. yeah. And um, that we knew because a lot of our boys already went f before the ghetto. Before. And they, they could write, and they told, in, in the letters, they told us that they are all right, that they're working. Do you know where the work camp was, how far away from Vodovici? Oh, it was in Germany. Oh. The, all those camps were in Germany. Right. And before the ghetto, did you have to wear any special distinguishing feature? Yeah, we feature? had to. But first we wore white uh, with a uh, Magnum David. And then we wore yellow stars with Yuda on it. Right. Do you remember uh, when the armband and then later the stars, when you uh, had to start wearing in them? In the beginning, wear only the band. And when, from when approximately? That was, uh, maybe, uh, maybe 40 or we wore the... the armband. Uh, no, the armband we wore till 40 mm. or 41. I don't remember really the dates. And then, I, but I remember we wore you the a, a yellow star, even in front and in the back. 
that they can recognize us from the front and from the back. And when we went to the get, oh, and, and yes, and um, where was I when we were in, in then the, there was the selection. And I was put up to the right. And my sister was put up with me. But my mother, because she was with the little boy, with my brother, she was put up, I saw from far, to the old people. So I went up to Mengele and I begged him, I said to him, uh, I, I spoke in German and I said to him, that I have still a very young mother. My mother didn't wear, you know, she wore lipstick and she put on, she was nicely dressed because we were all nice dressed, especially for that occasion. And he asked me, where is my mother? And I showed that. And he said, uh, call, call your mother. And he let me let my mother through. And your brother? And my little brother just ran through through the back. And that's how we got in all of us to the ghetto. And then when we were already in the ghetto, a Jewish milits, milit, uh, police, uh, they called it militia. And that was police. And uh, he brought my father back into the ghetto. And we were very lucky. We were the whole family together. Do you remember? I, sorry. Do you remember Mengele's manner? Do you remember no, anything no. about how he spoke? No, I remember from later on how he he behaved he, because right. I met him once again. Okay. So later you tell us I about, met him. Right. And how did they find your father to bring him back into the? No, I told him, and I went with that policeman. Yeah. I went together with the policemen out from the ghetto and we brought and we could go home before we went into the ghetto we could go home and take our furniture a bed a cupboard uh, you know a, a table we could do that how far was the ghetto from your house it was not far maybe a half an hour no 15 minutes, 20 minutes walk, walk, but it was in the poorest part from the city. It was, you know, they were little dilapidated houses. It was the back of big houses. There was one, two, I'm trying to picture it, three streets. But from one side, from one side it was the back of a street, the back and the very small little dilapidated houses. The poorest people used to live there. They took those people who lived there, they gave them our uh, flats or houses wherever we lived and we went in there but we still got one room there and um, that girl who was with me stayed with us her mother was already gone and she, uh, Rutka was her is her name and she was with us living with us and then they had another three or four girls in the next room, so she lived with the other girls there, but in the same house. And in the ghetto, we were working in a, a, a factory What we were sewing uniforms. Uh, we were sewing uh, f the, the uniforms we were sewing for the soldiers, for German soldiers. And um, we were working like 
in a, a type work. One was uh, sewing the uh, sleeves, the other the front, and the other together. One was sewing together. I was sewing the um, sleeves, I remember. I was with my father on one shift, and my mother and my sister was on the other shift. I remember once <coughs> when I was for the, uh, ready, before I went for the afternoon shift, um, my little brother was playing outside the room and uh, there was a policeman there, a good pol German policeman, and he picked, my brother had blue eyes and blonde, he was blonde, and he picked up that little boy in, you know, up. He took him in, in, in his hands and he picked him up and he said to him, Was bist du schuldig, dass du ein Jude bist? That means, whose fault is it that you are a Jew? And he gave him a lolly. I saw that through the window. I was so scared when I saw him, I thought that he would do something to that child, but no, he didn't do no harm. He was one of the good ones. Unfortunately, there wasn't many. Sometimes I used to clean, from the ghetto, I used to clean his house, so I got a bit of rice and a bit of sugar. And uh, sometimes I used to go out from the ghetto without, um, without the star. And uh, from, from uh, I bought it a few, you know, bread or flour or whatever I could get and uh, smuggled it into the ghetto. How did you manage to get past the guards? Uh, the, the guards gate? were Jewish on one side. As when you got out, in one inside they were a Jewish guard. Outside were the German guard. But uh, I had a Jewish guard, a friend, and he sometimes took me out and he said I need to go to a doctor or when I went uh, when I went cleaning up cleaning the houses I also I had to go out and they didn't check us what we bringing in. They didn't. And where did you go usually from the ghetto around? No, the no, 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 we were very close. We couldn't go, I didn't go too far, but I went qu quite a few times. And when, we, when I went cleaning up, cleaning, that was further. That was, uh, they used to live in a villa and, uh, and we cleaned there. And they, some of the Germans, gave us something to eat or something to take with you home, some of them. What, what? And that was until 1942, until May 1942. And then the, the oldest from the, like the president, whatever you call him, from from the boat of deputies, from the Yiddish Gemeinde. He, he was a distant relative to my mother. And he came to my parents and he said, uh, you have to give somebody. We, we need 50, we need 50 girls and you are the whole family together. Everybody is talking in the ghetto. You have to give someone. So as I was the oldest, my mother said, I, I will go. <coughs> I remember in the ghetto, we all had, every night, we had rucksacks packed. And uh, every one of us had a few the German mark sewn up in in the coat, you know, in, in a coat or in a, a jumper, whatever. 
here. Some money. Some money. Mm. That whatever will happen, that we have some money with us. And uh, because in the ghetto, when we were in the ghetto, we were 30 kilometers from Auschwitz. We heard rumors, but we didn't believe them just the same, you know? Somebody ran away, somebody came back, somebody came to the ghetto and they said, Yidin me brand. Translate that, the, the, the Jews, they burning us alive. And still we didn't believe it. It's impossible. How can they burn people alive? It's, it, it can't be. We are working. The German needs us. They, they need the, the, the uniforms for the front. And the oldest also told us that as long as we will work and we are healthy, we'll stay in the ghettos. And we believed them. And when he came and he said that uh, somebody has to go, there was 50 girls there. Did they give you any indication of what they were needed for, girls? Yes, they told us we're going to work. They all told us we're going to work. They didn't know where, but they need us uh, to work in factories in Germany. And they sent us, they came, that was again uh, on Shavuot, that's a Jewish holiday. And they put us on autos, big uh, trucks, and um, we went to Sosnowiec. Uh, that was, uh, that's a dulak. Um, it, it, it is a place, <coughs> there was hundreds of hundreds of people. It was like hell there. We didn't get anything to eat or to drink. It was terrible. And there was again a selection. And we stayed there for two weeks. And from there they sent us to Gabestorf, where I spent the rest time in that Gabestorf. Okay. I'm sorry, I'd just like to go back a little bit to the Badovica ghetto. Yeah. Um, just <coughs> if there were any sort of religious or Jewish activities organised in the ghetto, any... Yeah, it was. Uh, it, right. was. What, what? it was. Mm -hmm. We were... We, we, we could keep... Our, uh, we kept the uh, holidays. We... That there was a, like a, a little school, like a kindergarten was there. And we gathered together, the young people, when we had time, because we were working, I think, I don't remember, if it was, was it from seven till two or half past two, something like that, and then the other shift. And we were, um, so we were singing songs and we were gathering together and the, the, as much as we could in, in, in somebody else's place every time. And uh, we were hoping that the war will end soon and we will survive. We all survive. We didn't know, you see, at that time I had two friends and their parents were sent, sent away and they didn't know where they were sent, where they sent them. Because the mother was a little bit older and the father was limping, they sent them away. And we don't, till today, we don't know where they sent them away. We don't know where they perished, not at all. Like I don't know, we, I don't know what's happened to my grandparents. All those people in Shanov, I, I've been there after the war and I couldn't find anybody. And nobody knew what happened. They are people who lived uh, in, 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 um, they lived through in lag, in, they were in different concentration camps, but they left before 
the, the um, selection. They left before that. So one doesn't know what happened to the other, because I was looking up in Yad Vashem also, and I couldn't find. They are hundreds and thousands of people, but they don't know what's happened to them. Was yeah. there a, a Yudin rat in the... Uh, yeah, that right, was the Yudin rat. Yeah. And what was your opinion of the Yudin rat? Were they trusted by the community? Or? Not at all. No. Not at all. Why? They, the the Yudin rat were, as I said, they were looking after themselves. Because they, we had um, cards, Verpflegungs cards, how do you say? Russian Russia. cards, yes. And um, we're supposed to get uh, that much bread and that much sugar and that much uh, butter. And uh, the Judenrat, they looked after each other, after themselves. They is a saying, uh, you know, who is, um, who is near, near the food, he looks after himself. And that's how it was in the ghetto. Right. And the role of the Jewish police, how were they perceived by the community there? Well, some of them were all right. I didn't, you know, I didn't start any in our ghetto. There was no bad police, no, okay. no. Like they say, they were kapos, not in our ghetto. It was a small ghetto. It was, I think it was 1,200 people when we stayed in the ghetto. So everybody knew everybody and, uh, and you know, I don't know how to say, the, the Judenrat wasn't, the Judenrat wasn't good. First of all, there was the, the, the president from the Judenrat, it was not from our town, it was Majerczyk, he was then from Sosnovce. Maybe you've heard, there was a Marine, Monik Marine, he was in charge of the whole Dritten Reich, the Jews from the whole Dritten Reich. Our, our ghetto, Radovice, was one of the last one to be um, sent to Auschwitz. Okay. They liquidated our ghetto, that was the last one. Okay, this is the end of tape number two. This is tape number three of an interview with um, Sabina Winter. Okay, um, where did you go from the Vadovitsa ghetto? Where were you taken? I said it in the other tape that we went to Bendin. <coughs> where was and in that? Bendin? That was Sosnov, Sosnovets, mm -hmm. Bendin, Sosnovets. It was called Dulak, and. Really, it was held. Uh, we we didn't get anything to eat. Once a day, we got a little bit of soup, and we didn't have nothing to do. We were lying all day on on those straw mattresses, and it was so many people. There might be a few thousand at once. Were most and of the, the people from the Radovitsa ghetto? Were, no, no, no. They were people from all different states, from all different towns or from different ghettos. And um, for, for, uh, for a fortnight we were there, and then there was another selection. And they choose, uh, uh, again, 50 girls. They were girls from different uh, towns, not only from Wadowice. And um, they chose me and a few of my friends uh, to Gabestorf. We went to Gabestorf. 
Be that was that was a, a working camp. And your family? Were My family stayed at home. My family stayed at home until 1943. They stayed in the ghetto. So you were taken to Bendin alone? Uh, by myself. Yeah. My parents had to give one of their children. Yeah. And as I was the oldest, my mother said, you going. Uh, mm -hmm. She said, shine let in fire nicht verbrennt werden. That means she won't burn in, in, in fire. I will manage everywhere. I did. But I, when, when we came to Gabesdorf, how far was that from Bendy? That was in Sudetengebiet, Czechoslovakia, yeah. And um, you did the journey by train or? We did it by train, yes. And the we conditions? We did it by train and the conditions were very good. We were, we were traveling by train like normal people. We were so surprised. Who was guarding you? Or uh, they were only women guarding us. German? German mm -hmm. women, they were guarding us. And we even got uh, to eat on the uh, train. We got sandwiches. We were treated like people. It was such a big difference from, from Dulak, from Bendin, to the journey on the train. It's a pity that it only lasted a few hours. Did it make you feel that maybe things were yes, going to we get did. better? We thought that we we will be people again and we will be mentioned, you know, okay. treated like people. And um, we came and we were we saw there was uh, three hundred and fifty people already there and there was an appeal. A uh, selection. Uh, no, uh, it wasn't call. a selection, like a roll call. Mm -hmm. And they uh, first, uh, for us, and they told us that uh, if we will be working here, we will be working in a factory, and if we will be working, we will live through the war. Because they need us, and uh, that was a um, Spinnerei factory. Uh, how you say spinnerai? Um, just a minute. Oh, slipped my mind. Cotton, cotton. They produce from cotton weaving. yarn. Weaving. Weaving, yeah. yeah. And um, I was still a strong girl, and they gave me to a very uh, hard work. I had to. The, f the cotton, that flax, the raw cotton, I had to pull apart. And it was very, uh, a lot of dust there in that cotton. And I started coughing, and I started coughing with blood. And I didn't know what to do, and I told to the girls there. There was in that uh, concentration, uh, no, there wasn't, a, that wasn't a concentration camp yet. It was Arbeit's camp, and uh, there w I talked to a, uh, uh, the um, nurse. There was a nurse there, and I talked to the nurse, and I told her, and I showed it to her that I'm, I'm um, coughing with blood. And she said, look, if you save, if you can save a packet of butter, once a month comes a doctor here and he will take you out from there. We used to get uh, uh, like two spoons of butter a week and one spoon of jam a week and a quarter of bread. And in the morning we had um, like uh, black coffee and for lunch we had uh, a potato or soup. And in the evening, we again had black coffee, but with that bread, what we got, the bread, we could have a piece of bread. If you could save the bread, then the, everybody had, 
you know, a piece. I always save a piece of in the morning and a piece for the evening. But there were some girls who couldn't save that bread. He, I, she, they ate it up at once. And then they stole one from the other. Was bread stolen from you? Oh, often? many times, yeah. many, many times. But I, I had a good friend in the kitchen. She was working in the kitchen. I used to put in a, um, a pot with, with water, and she used to put in a, a couple of spoons of soup, ladles of soup, and that was thick soup. So I really didn't starve in, in the lager. And then, then, after a few months, the eldest, the, the Lagerführer, came and he said, that we, they, they, we will have to become a um, concentration camp, and we will belong to Gross Rosen, and he will be very strict with us in front of the SS people, but he hasn't changed, he is the same. And he needs another 50 people, if we have young parents at home, sister, to write home. We could write still at that time. Were you also receiving mail from, yes, yes, from your did. parents? Yes, yeah. because my father wrote to me. I wrote to my father what I should do. Uh, they gave us uh, horse meat to eat. Mm. If I should eat it, and my father said, to stay alive, you eat anything. So uh, I wrote home to my mother and uh, to my parents, and I said that my sister and my mother, cause she, she can still come, because when they need 50 people, I didn't get any answer anymore. But two mothers came, and quite a few sisters came, and they lived through the war. Did they come from Wadowice? No, no not from Wadowice. They came from Sosnovce, right. from Bendin Sosnovce. They came from there. Yeah. You mentioned also <coughs> that we, when you saw the nurse, when you were coughing blood, yes, she said... Yes, when yeah. we, I said about what we're getting, food. So when I saved the, man, the butter, I saved up that butter. I didn't eat it. I saved it up. I gave it to the doctor who came. A Jewish doctor? A Jewish doctor. He used to come once a month from another camp. There were a few small camps around us, and we all belonged to Gross Rosen. And um, it, 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 one doctor was there over three or four camps. It was over our, over our, our stadt. There were three, four camps, I think, around us. And um, I gave him that butter, and he took me out from that work. He wrote me a letter, and, and, uh, and that letter he gave to the Judenälteste, and the Judenälteste gave it to the Lagerführer, the, the, the director, and um, they changed my work to a much cleaner work not as hard. What sort and, of work? Um, that was in Hechelai. I was, um, I was throwing the, that um, flex, I was throwing up, and, and then I put it in, in um, like in a, in a pile. It was much easier. We were working uh, three shifts there night shift and, and uh, two day shifts. If a few, quite a few people, a, a couple of people died in that camp because um, from religious point of view, because she wouldn't eat anything. Both well, of nutrition. Them. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And uh, one day, I don't remember exactly which year it was, Mengele came. We knew, because the, 
Lagefirerin, that, that means the SS woman, told us the good one, because they were bad ones and good ones. Th this one was a good one, and she told us that tomorrow comes um, Mengele with his staff to prepare ourselves that we are clean, that we look good, because there will be a selection. And th there was a roll call. We had numbers. I didn't, I don't remember my number, but we didn't have numbers uh, on, on the hands, but we had numbers. We were called by the number. And um, it was maybe five o'clock in the morning when it was that roll call. We all came out. And uh, and then that was outside, and then we went inside, and they told us to take off our clothes. They they made a circle with a pencil, with a color pencil, a big circle. We had to get completely, completely undressed, and hence up and turn slowly turn around naked knocked in that circle and if you had a spot on you uh, they, they send away then 70 girls from us I stayed but I never forget that time today when you talk uh, knocked it's nothing, but in those days, it was such a terrible thing for us, and we didn't know where where the other girls are going. You know, we were so worried, but uh, they survived the war too. Well, the girls that were taken yeah, away. Yeah. Do you know where they went? Uh, I don't remember where they went, but they didn't go to Auschwitz anymore because that was already lighter. And how do you know they survived? Did you because meet Because I've met a friend of mine here. I've met her here. And uh, she was one of those girls who were sent away, yes. She just passed away 10 months ago. <sighs> yeah, where, where was, was I? To, uh, yeah, yeah, when we were, uh, our barracks were behind the factory. We haven't had, we could have about 200 yards to go to the factory. And um, the only thing was that we didn't have any socks and in winter it was snow and uh, we couldn't get any socks because that's what we brought from home were already torn. And we got um, a wooden, um, a wooden, uh, Tongs. Just we, everybody got wooden tongs, and our feet were frozen. We could uh, bite our. Have, we had showers. Once in two weeks we had a shower, but every day we had enough cold water we could wash ourselves and keep clean. The shower was with warm water. No, Just, no, no, wash. Yeah, but they were every two weeks was it warm water? Every two weeks we had hot water. Yeah. But you couldn't spend too much time mm -hmm. there because they were standing outside the SS woman and uh, you had five minutes and they told you next one, the next one. You couldn't stay too long, but uh, we had those showers we had once in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And we could also wash our clothes with cold water. Everything was with cold water. With the we, sorry, with the selection from before, was that with Mengele? Did you see him again close up, or did you have any contact with him? Not at all. No. Only only the the second time I saw him in in concentration camp. So that's later on. Later oh, on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A few la a few years yeah. later. Yeah. yeah. Two years later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And. Um, so you're talking about the showers and the... Yes. Yeah. Uh, we were about uh, 
35 or 40 girls in one room. We well, had banks, mm -hmm. double banks, and uh, straw, straw mattresses, sacks. Actually, that was like a sack, and we filled it up with straw. I don't remember with what we covered ourselves up. I think we've got some kind of a blanket. We've got a blanket there. We didn't have any cushions, but we had blankets there. And we had, um, there were two barracks. It was in the middle of the barrack, there was a, a, a big stove, like an oven. And, and we put uh, wood and briquettes in. And um, that kept warm the whole, because it was very cold there. It was snowing in winter, it was frosty and snow. In summer it was all right. And we had, um, we had to clean the barracks, so clean the toilets, clean the barracks, you know. The, there is in Australia our um, Judenälteste, that means the oldest. Uh, she was in charge. And she used to wake up at five o'clock, wake up, up at five o'clock in the morning because we had to go wash ourselves in the shift and so on. At uh, six, we went already to the factory. So she woke us up at five. And uh, she married an um, Australian guy who was there. There were a few <coughs> a few uh, soldiers, not soldiers, no. Gefangene, how do you call Gefangene? Uh, they were soldiers. They were, they was uh, two Australian and two Englishmen and two and a few um, American, they were there also working. And they helped us a lot. In what they, way? They used to get uh, parcels from the Red Cross. And whenever the SS didn't look, they give in uh, a bit of uh, a, a tin of rice or a tin of, of, of meat or a tin of something because they used to get those parcels there. Why did they get them? Because they weren't Jewish or no, they, they were, were Jewish. because they were soldiers? No, they were um, soldiers. Um, Gefangene. No, I don't know how to say the Gefangene soldiers. Oh God, I forgot the name. It, it's I forgot completely. Gefangene. Like inter, inter, uh, in, like in, in, in jail, when you take somebody in. Prisoners. Prisoners. Prisoners of war. They were prisoners of war, that's right. They were prisoners of war and they uh, uh, got, every month they got parcels from the Red Cross. And um, the, 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 so the, some of them were very good to us, and they shared the parcels because we were we weren't really starving, but we were hungry always. Mm -hmm. And uh, that girl, she well, they fall in love, and they got married after the war. She lives in the, in now she lives in Sydney. Were you receiving news from any other parts of Poland or was there still any mail coming in? Or? That's what I'm coming up to it. One day in 1943, I think it was uh, August, I think it was in August or end of July or beginning of August, it was Tishibav. A couple of weeks later, we got a letter because a, um, a, f a friend of mine who came 
with the same transport as myself. Uh, she had a friend, a Paul, and she was receiving letters all the time. And then she got a letter from him that uh, Wadowice was Judenrein. There is no more Jews in Wadowice. And that was in Tishibov. And uh, we found out that uh, everybody was, went to Auschwitz. From the whole 12, 12, there wasn't 1,200, it was 1,150 people, five girls stay alive. From the whole transport, they went, they died in the same day. They were guests. That was, so I'm keeping that yard side. So I know that my parents died in Tishibov. And uh, that's what I'm keeping. But I don't know the rest of the family. All I know, because they all died in the same day, they were guests. Those five girls who survived, I've met two of them after the war, and they told me the story. So that's how I know. But the rest of my family, I don't know. That was, that was then. No, we went on living. We knew when is Rosh Hashanah, when is Pesach. How did you celebrate these holidays? We didn't celebrate. We didn't. We fasted on Yom Kippur. And the rest we didn't, we didn't keep. And then, when it was towards the end of the war, we were working in, um, in trenches. We were digging trenches. And when we were working at the trenches, a couple of times we were there and planes were passing and they threw down pieces of paper and it was written, hold on, the war is nearly finished. In those times, in, in those few weeks, they didn't give us anything to eat, you know? They, whatever we could uh, get, there was a potato here, a potato, uh, a, a bit of pills there, a bit of vegetables there. But the Czech people were very, very nice to us. They also helped us a lot. So from the neighboring, uh, the neighbors. They to were the working there too in that factory. You must know that there was a few hundred people working there. And some of them were very good to us. They didn't have much easier, but they shared. They, 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 brought you, they brought a sandwich or an apple or, you know, or a potato even. Sometimes maybe a piece of cake. They, they did help us. And they told us, girls, you'll survive. The end is near. And uh, one day, uh, we saw, sometimes we saw uh, uh, Russian prisoners of war passing by you know, they took them from one place to, to the other. In trucks or walking? Walking, walking. And if they were so, <clears throat> so tired and so, you know, uh, torn, clothes torn and dirty. 
We saw them through the windows. And uh, one day we woke up and nobody was there. There was no guard. There was nobody there. And uh, some of the Czech who were working with us came and they said, girls, stay inside because there are mines all around your barracks. Don't move until we fix it up. And they, uh, they cleaned up the those mines, the whole place, otherwise we would be blown up because they ran away, the SS men and the SS women, they ran away and they left us. Mm -hmm. <coughs> when was this? That was near the end, the, the end of the war, 1940, 1945. Okay. And um, when they cleaned up, oh, what did I do here? Sorry. This is the end of tape number three. Oh, this is? You this see? is tape number four of an interview with Sabina Winter. Okay. At the end of the last tape, you were telling us about the end of the war in Gubbersdorf when the German, the German guards had run away. What happened next? We were alone and uh, the Czech people came and I said already in the tape that they took away the mines mm -hmm. and then the prisoners of war came over to us also and they opened all the magazines where they kept food. There was plenty of food but they didn't give it to us. But they opened it and we, we went in there and we took what we could. We took whatever we could and then uh, a few hours later, uh, um, a Russian motorbike came with a Russian on it. And uh, then uh, came on a horse, on horses a few, and then the Russian came. They uh, liberated us uh, the 8th of May. We were liberated there. They were also hungry. They were hungry, they were dirty, they were tired. And uh, we were scared of them too, because maybe they didn't want to do any harm to us, but they were tired. So I was lying one night in bed and I woke up, I started screaming because a Russian was lying next to me. He didn't touch me, he didn't do anything to me, but he was tired, he saw a little piece of uh, room, he lay down. So uh, the Czech people, they made a guard and they guarded us. I don't remember how many days I was there after the war. I don't know, days or weeks. And then every one of us wanted to go home because we were hoping that the way we were liberated, we might be, maybe somebody is alive. Somebody. I was, I knew already that uh, my parents were uh, sent to Auschwitz, but I didn't know that they were dead. So I was hoping that maybe I meet my sister, maybe somebody. 
So we were trying to go back. The trains, uh, the transport was terrible those days because uh, everything was out of place. And um, it took me probably a few weeks till I got back to Wadowice. But first we came to, to, to Poland, to Bielsko, and, to, and wherever we went, I put my name on. And we were looking for names from the family. Who were you traveling with? Were you with my friends friend. from concentration camp. That was that they were my sisters. We stuck together all the time until, uh, and we came to Wadowice, and I did, then in Wadowice I found out that nobody from my family is alive. How so did you find that out? From the two girls who lived through Auschwitz. And then I went to Kshanov, and I didn't meet anybody there. But wherever I went, I left my name and my address. I didn't have a, a special address, but I left my name and uh, that I am alive. I remember meeting the first Jewish boys. Uh, uh, the, the first word was Amchu. When we, we didn't know that they were Jews or non-Jews, so it looks like the other people were already liberated and they had a word between themselves, Amchu. And that's how they, we recognize one another. Can you translate that? Am, Amchu means not exactly Jew, it means one of us. Uh, you are one of us? And, and that's how we recognize each other, because the, the people were traveling and looking for family everywhere, everywhere. And, uh, you know, it was, wherever you went, there was, uh, uh, they were uh, like um, Jewish post of deputies. They might, you know, they tried to help you, to, to you, look, I didn't have where to go. I didn't have anybody. I didn't have where to go. I wanted to go where I was, where we were living to our flat. The Polish woman wouldn't let me in. She said, ta żydówka jeszcze żyje? That means the, 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 that Jewish uh, 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 girl is still alive? And I said, look, I want to see my home. Maybe there is something left from my parents. And she said, you're not coming in, into my house. You haven't got nothing to look here for. So I asked that, um, that, that there is, in every house there is a, a, a janitor. And, and uh, I asked him if I can go or to the cellar, or to the cellar or upstairs, maybe I find something from my parents. And I found. What did you find? I found a menorah, and I found some, some prayer books, what I used to go to school with, torn, dirty, but I found. I found a spoon, what was from home. I found a few photos, broken up. Whatever I, I found, I took with me. I showed him, and I took it with me. I, I was at only a few days, I never went back there. And then I lived in, in Bielsko. Where's, where was Bielsko? I went with my friend to Bielsko because she, she met a sister who lived through. Oh, can you stop a minute? Okay. My daughter is coming. Yeah.
I don't know, where was I up to? Okay. Um, this is a continuation of tape number four. We just had to stop for a minute. Um, you were talking about after liberation, your friend found her sister and you yes, didn't find and, any and relatives. So we stuck together. We stuck together uh, for quite a while and we, um, the friend of mine, she found also a cousin who had his flat. He got back his flat from before the war and we were living there. In which town was that? In Bielsko. Bielsko. Bielitz, Bielsko. And um, we get, uh, you know, uh, uh, Cards. I don't remember how do I li how did I leave money I didn't have. <clears throat> I think we get from the uh, Yiddish Gemeinde. Uh, that means from uh, the Jewish uh, Board of Deputies. Like we g we got some money, and um, I forgot to tell you uh, one thing. When I was in Dulak. One of the Germans pulled out a earring from my ear, from my right ear. I had two earrings and uh, it was like a forget-me-not in gold. And uh, he went up, he, he didn't guard, tell me, a, a, German guard, guard. A, a German guard, an assessment. He didn't tell me, take it off, give it to me. He just pulled it out and it started bleeding. And uh, I, I took out the other one and gave it to me. That's why I said it was held there. And uh, that's how they behave. That was their behavior. Now I go back. I just remembered it now. I, I forgot a lot of things. My memory is not so good. I should have done that type at least 30 years ago. Every one of us should have done that. It's getting too light. It's getting to be too light. So I was in, in, yeah, in Bielsko, Bielitz, and um, there I'd met my husband. And um, we me. were looking, we yeah. were looking still for relatives. We were traveling and traveling and traveling, and I couldn't find anybody. Okay. So yeah. we decided to go back to Germany because we didn't have any money. And they told us that from Germany we can go to Palestine. That was still Palestine then, illegal. So who would have helped you go to Palestine? Well, well, they they told us there who uh, the, the, the 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 Jewish Board of Deputies that in in the the uh, this DP camps, displaced peoples camps, they are madrichim, they are organizations, and they shifting young people to Israel. So we decided we will go. We'll go back to Germany. And um, we go to Israel. And when we went back, we wanted to go back to Germany. They caught us in, in Walbrzech, Waldenburg. And I was in jail for, for probably a week or five days until oh, a week. And then I tore up my letters, what I still had from home, because that was Russian. And we, <coughs> that cousin of my friend found out that we are in jail, he came. I don't know how he got us out but he got us out. Your friend and you. Yeah. Yes, yes. It was a whole group because we didn't smuggle ourselves by ourselves. We went with a group. 
Was this an organized group? An organized group. They, they smuggled, wanted to smuggle us in to Germany. And in Germany, we could have gone in, into a DP camp. And what was the name of the group? Do you remember? I don't remember. No. A Jewish youth organization? It or? was from a Jewish organization, yeah. but oh, the, the name, what, I don't remember. Okay. We went, uh, yeah, he took us out from Jair and we went to, uh, we smuggled us the rest of the way, we went through and we came to Germany. And they took us, I think they are here, they took us to Bamberg. And Bamberg was a special, and Bamberg was a, a DP camp with a few hundred of people. And we had to stay again in a queue to get a little bit of soup and in the morning to get the breakfast, and in the evening again a bit of soup. And I said to the friend of mine, I said, we live through the war for this? It looks like I was back in camp. Only we've got a bit more of soup now. And I said to her, let's go and see if, how other people live. You, don't, you didn't need any money f to, to travel by train those days. You went on the train and you traveled. So I said, uh, uh, my friend's name was Ruzia. So I said to her, let's go. We go to Munich. And um, when we came to Munich, no, uh, on the, the train didn't go completely, not that far. The train went to Fürth, this is Bayern, Germany, and, and we had to wait for the second train to take us to Munich till the evening. So we met somebody again at the station, and that person told us, you know what? Here is a DP camp in Fürth, Finkenschlag was the name of it. Go there, you get a soup, you get a coffee, and you can wait there for the day. So we, we, we went there, they, he showed us the way, and we went there. When approximately was this? That was after the war. Mm -hmm. in that was still in 1945, yes. Towards the end of 1945. And we went there, and while we were there standing, a friend of mine said, you know, Shinda, um, Leon Winter is here. And I said to her, no, he's not here, he is in Berlin. Because he told me then, when I met my husband, he told me he is going to Berlin. When he's was not, that? That was in Bielsko. Mm -hmm. Bil Bil and that was, that was the first yeah. time that you met him? That was the second time when right. I met him. And when was the first time that the you met him? The first time was in Poland, in Bielsko. Mm -hmm. And Under what circumstances did after you... After the war, when I was living in that, my uh, friend's flat, with my friend and her cousin's flat. And, uh, and, I said, uh, and she said, Leon Winter is here. I said, no, it's impossible because he is in Berlin. And then we, I looked at her and I turned around and it was Leon Winter. And he, so he was very happy to see us. He knew my friend, he knew me. And he said, come to my place. He had a, a, a bedroom and a kitchen and a bathroom, a little house, like um, two, but actually there were two rooms and a kitchen and a bathroom. And we went there and he gave us to eat and he, and he said, you know what, stay here, maybe I will be able 
to um, write your name down and you, you will be able to stay here because th that was already full. They didn't take any more people there. So we were talking with uh, my friend and she said, all right, we'll stay. He was living with another two friends there. There were three of them and he, they gave us a room and he, he and we stayed there for, for instead of, of a day we stayed a whole week and after a week he 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 went to to that boat of deputies there was also a jewish uh, thing and um, they put our names down but we didn't have where to live only we, they put our names down only if we can stay there with them. So we were five people there in the two rooms. Um, is Ibi there? Mm. Are they waiting for Ibi? Mm. Uh -huh. okay. Do you want the whole family together or they can the whole family together? Yes, so continue. Uh -huh. Okay. And um, We stayed there. We didn't have our clothes. We didn't have much clothes, but we didn't have what we had. It was left in Bamberg there. We went back to Bamberg. We took our clothes. We brought the other sister as well with us. And we stayed there in Fürth. And after six weeks, my husband proposed and we got married. When were you married? In 1951. Uh, no, 46. Oh, uh, uh, 46, yeah. 46. I'm so bright now. And where, where did the ceremony we, take place? We got married in Feldafing. That was another displaced uh, camp, DP camp. Uh, my husband's friend, my husband, lived through the war in Russia and uh, he had a very close friend there and that friend lived in Feldaf in, in yes in that f and he had like a restaurant there so he made the wedding for us and there was a rabbi already there and uh, we had a proper chuppah but I didn't wear a a white dress because I was too upset. And we got married after six weeks, knowing each other. And we were married for 45 years until my husband passed away. And we were a very, very good couple. Where did you go next? How long did you stay in the DP camp with your husband? We stayed, um, I don't remember how long, maybe a year or two years, and then we went to the town, to Fürth, not in camp, we didn't live in camp anymore. We went, um, we lived in the city. Uh, that rabbi from that, um, Rabbi Shapiro, he, he took us there, he gave us a flat, and uh, we lived there. Okay. And there was my son was born in, in Fürth, in Germany. And did your husband work, or did you or your no, husband? No, he didn't work. He, he was a Schwarzhandler. You know what it means? What, how can, you, can I say a Schwarzhandler? Try and describe it as best as you can in English, please. He was uh, buying stuff from the, from the American. He sold it to the Germans or to the Jews. And he earned uh, a few dollars here and a few dollars there. And uh, that's how we lived. Mm -hmm. 
but I think the majority of Jews lived like that there in Germany. You mentioned your son was born. Yes. What's his name? Abraham David, like my father. He got my father's name. Yeah. Okay. He was born in Germany. I, actually, I didn't want to have any children in Germany. I didn't. I didn't meet anybody, and I didn't want to have any children, and I didn't. I didn't want to leave. I didn't see any sense in going on to be Jewish. I didn't believe in anything. Then my auntie from Russia, she, they remember I said in the time before we ran away to Yaroslav, my auntie ran away also with the three children and her husband. Her husband died in Russia and she survived and she came back to Poland. And because I left everywhere my name, she found me in Fürth. And she, she looked me up and she came and she said to me, did you forget who your parents were? From where your roots are? Did you forget, forget your upbringing? And I told her my story, and I said to her, what's the use? She said, no, you don't do things like that. You survive with a purpose. You have to continue living. And she brought me back to Yiddishkeit. And then I had my son, after that I had my son. And when you have a child, you have to give him something. So I saw that I have a purpose. So That's what it was. And then that friend, what we married in, uh, what we got married in, in um, Feldafing, he came to Melbourne, or maybe a half a year or a year before us, and he sent us an uh, affidavit. Because we wanted to go, I wanted to go to Israel. It was already Israel, and I wanted to go to Israel, but uh, my husband wasn't wasn't so keen. So and um, we couldn't go straight to Israel. We had to wait. It wasn't so easy those days to go anywhere. We put our names down to to go to Israel, to go to America, to go to Australia, and the first time. Affidavit to Australia. Okay. What? That's how we came here. Okay. What did you know of Australia? Nothing. Did, nothing. Nothing. It's a fact that when I went to say goodbye to the rabbi, what gave me the flat, he said to me, Where are you going? It's a Wiesdenish. It's a Wiesdenish that means it's uh, an empty place. It's far away. There is no people, hardly any Jews are there. How will you live? What will you do? You survive to be a Jew. And I, then I already said to him, you know, if you want to, you can be a Jew everywhere. That was those days. And um, I met that rabbi after, uh, after five or six years later in Israel, and I introduced him to my son. And he said that I was right. He, was, he remembered me. 
years, years later, I've met him. Okay. This is the end of tape number four.